Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So I'm back at the Al Cornish area by the Al Wahhab Mosque in in Doha. Um, the last time I was like uploading pretty regularly, I was in this area, Cornish White Palace area, by the centering around the Al Wahhab Mosque. But um, what happened was, you know, I was out of money. And I went through all the things that I said I was going to do. Ended up sent from the Interior Ministry Human Rights Department, which deals with asylum, to being at uh, it deals with asylum to being at um, being sent to the National Human Rights Committee. And they it was just all part of a runaround, you know. At the end of the day, I got the unspoken message very clearly that they, you know, even if I got my application through, uh, you know, it's not going anywhere. Like, I imagine, you know, if I could communicate, per, you know, like perfectly and have everything in proper order and the law perfectly applies, it's still, you know, that was just through the runaround and the, the treatment it was pretty clearly communicated, you know. And, um, yeah, so, so after that, like, I, it was, it was like a Thursday, it was like a fr equivalent to a Friday, like, I went, and then they told me to come back on the equivalent of a Monday, right, like, and went back, and that's when the National Human Rights Committee also just, just like, whatever, and they told me to go back to immigration, but in immigration, they had told me, uh, like, one officer said, don't come back to this office, and he was the one who was about to give me the exception, but then last minute didn't. Uh, like tantalizing torture kind of. And the bigger general, uh, he just yelled at me that you have to leave. But like it wasn't clear how it was. Like he didn't try to understand the situation. So I didn't know if he was saying that I could leave. Or that I had to find a way to like pay the fees and then leave. Um, because there's no way I'll be stuck here forever if I have to do that. And... Um, so anyways, after that happened, I was full, you know, discouraged. I go through these phases of mujahida and discouragement, you know. So that's kind of where the mujahida ended. It was right before Ramzan. Ramzan started. And the place where this area or the other area, the Al Saad area where the National Human Rights Committee is. And I walked there, actually. Yeah, at the time, I didn't have currency um, for a long time. And all Ramzan, I didn't have any currency whatsoever. And the way I was getting by was they had a bunch of food tents and they were sadqa. And I've never eaten sadqa before in my life. Because I'm a Sayyid that was raised that way with that awareness. I had a Shaykh who was a Sharif from Hadramaut who I often mentioned. But, you know, I took it as a kard, you know, like I'm, I'm not taking this with the niyyah of sadqa. There's no one really to discuss the finer points of fiqh with here. You know, there and there was one particular tent who would treat you very respectfully and honorably, and they, they after a while kind of knew that I wasn't like the average Pakistani poor person. Just my frame, even you know, like so much taller than the average malnutrition Indian Pakistani person here. You know, like the way I speak, carry myself. It's, it's just I'm very distinct. I, I think it's I because I embody American values, like founding values. I think. It's unspoken eventually that they recognize that I'm American or something. I don't know. But uh, anyway, so, um, you know, I was going to that tent and surviving by have food, eating the iftar there, you know. And during the day, I would go to this caribou coffee. And it was like, it's there was a lot of people doing that, like being there. It's like free Wi-Fi all day. Um, as long as it's like you were cooperative to a certain degree or whatever kind of left you alone or we weren't there every day or whatever so I was there during Ramzan and after Ramzan um, um, I made some friends there kind of and so a few days after Ramzan I was hungry again but then like there's like few guys in a similar situation that have a spot where like an abandoned house where people were sleeping close to there some of those guys from North Africa would come like Algeria Tunisia made friends with them they kind of to care of food like at least a little bit for me for like a couple of days and then i got the courage to ask them to try to exchange some dollars for me 
and it worked out there and I found a location close to that area Al Saad area Al Fardan exchange that does that and so I had a little bit of money you know like I think a hundred or two hundred dollars and so I survived off of that till now and I was writing my case like I, I decided like strategically to pivot I always had like three or four courts in mind right so there was the federal court of claims there was the uh, the federal district court of eastern Louisiana and there was also uh, a Louisiana state court would would be kind of if Louisiana was a normal state and reliable in any sort of way uh, would maybe be the first place I would have gone um, but my case, because I'm a son of an immigrant and the immigration process and all this sort of stuff, I do have a solid case for federal court. Um, yeah, so anyways, I'll, I'll get into that. And I also considered state court of Colorado for partitioning part of the matter. But anyway, so like I was doing all this and the federal court of claims is where, not the federal, the Eastern District of Louisiana is where like my case is like, like that's the place where I can bring the whole totality of circumstances, all the parties can be joined to the case, etc. In, in de jure law, you know, common law proceedings, uh, I can include the U.S. government. And some, you know, uh, there's some finer points there regarding sovereign immunity and stuff like that. But um, you know, when I realized that I wouldn't be able to apply for asylum here, and Qatar was like a last desperate choice, you know. And I'm kind of in that mode, all of these three years, it's kind of been that mode, like one last desperate choice after another, you know? Like what's the next least desperate thing I can do? And so when I realized like even here, I wasn't gonna get help, this is not the place Allah had in mind to get help for me. And I went to the religious ministry and all that. When I realized that, then I started, I pivoted it. Instead of writing the, like the, the, the kind of thing to the interior ministry, or the, the, the human rights, uh, you know, letter that I have to give, the form. I started writing this case to the Federal Court of Claims. And the advantage of the Federal Court of Claims over Eastern District is the Eastern District case, because it is like the whole thing, is super complex, you know. But the thing in the Federal Court of Claims is that you're only suing the U.S. government and you have permission to sue. The, so sovereign immunity is like implicitly waived. And as long as you bring the case under, like, uh, I forgot the title 28, uh, I think it's 14 something, like that provides the jurisdiction to, of that court, like contracts, a constitution, whatever. As long as you're clearly within like the, the constitu uh, congressionally delegated uh, jurisdiction um, of that court, you can sue the U.S. government. And it's simple because you're only suing the U.S. government, you know, and its liabilities and subsidiaries. And so because it, it simplifies the thing, so it's like the, the, the claim in the federal court of claims is like the essentialist claim, right? It's like boiling down everything to an essential and like how you can blame everything on the U.S. government or as much of it, like I would say 80 to 90 percent of it can be blamed on the U.S. government. So it distills everything. It simplifies everything. And so I was writing that case for the federal court of claims. And it's basically rewriting the same case, but in a lot of ways, it's a much more simplified because I don't have to go through and consider the liabilities and the transgressions of like a myriad of parties. I just have to think about how the U.S. government was at fault, you know. And so um, I've been writing that and it went from being like three pages to 72 pages. Like, and it's very well organized. It's very well done. Um, I'm, I'm kind of proud of it. It's like the like it's like the third or fourth draft of like the whole kind of thing that I've done so far since leaving the U.S. And um, so the plan now is tomorrow uh, I came back to the Al Saad area, uh, to this Cornish White Palace area where the Al Wahhab Mosque is. Um, and now my plan is I'm just going to write uh, like I'm going to tomorrow to immigration again. And uh, other reasons I delayed this much was that I was trying to go back to the religious ministry with with like a friend. But, you know, it wasn't really a friend. You get that a lot in our countries, pre-modern countries, where people are just like, they're two-faced and manipulative. 
And now they're, they like act like your best friend, even like a religious friend, and then they're not really there when you need them. On you know, it's like this passive aggressive thing. Anyways, so like after that all tested out, we're like, okay, I don't, you know, I can't rely on anyone here uh, to help with anything. So I just decided I'm going to go to immigration now. Tomorrow I'm going to try to get them to let me leave. You know, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is like, you never negotiate for what you actually want. So I'm going to go in there negotiating for like them, like extending my visa temporarily. So I can go through the, the asylum process. And then I'm going to say like, brother, if you can't do that, then please just let me go. You know, like I came here to apply for asylum. I, I went to all the ministries. I tried to get help from the charity organization, which I don't want to anyways, because of being a Sayyid. I did everything I could and now I'm just asking like if you can't help me or you can't like let me apply for asylum just let me leave you know and um, so that's the plan for tomorrow and if they say yes then the US Embassy is, is like fairly close so I'm just gonna go to the Embassy the problem one of the problems I'm facing is like here um, like the the transportation system is pretty good but the buses can be really unreliable and so uh, like walking and there's no bus so like I have to walk at least about a mile from where I sleep I have particular sleep spots and like a mile in the morning like if I wake up 4 30 5 30 a.m. then I have to walk in the morning about a mile to get to a place a bus might be pick me up but it's unreliable um, this particular route has proven unreliable repeatedly and um, if I choose to walk it's a considerable walk you know like first thing in the morning it's like it's it's a considerable walk to the bus stop and then it's like double that to the to the actual immigration place but hopefully tomorrow early morning i've been trying to come like for a couple of days now more than a week actually but you know for a couple of days just the logistics here kind of suck for me the the situation i'm in so hopefully they'll approve if they do i'll go straight to the u.s embassy and figure out all I need is about a couple days, maybe four or five days to a week to like perfect the, the thing for the Federal Court of Claims. The idea is to get to DC and then directly from DC to um, DC to the Court of Federal Claims, like directly and like immediately have a hearing for emergency injunctive relief. That's the plan. And like I just the real reason I'm making this video or what like I you know the scapegoating thing I was describing the communal scapegoating thing that I've talked about a lot in this channel um having experienced it with my father like in the background his paternal tribe doing it to my mother and me but never like you know never directly communicating it so it's like happening in the background having consequences but it's never being verbalized or directly communicated you know except in odd moments and so like having to articulate that theoretically over the last two years as I write my case and then experiencing it like in different contexts again, you know. So before I left the United States, so my escapism, my mother's escapism driven by survival and CPTSD puts you in a situation where you're vulnerable and you're seeking a savior figure or salvation outside of yourself and other people who have the narcissistic god complex target you and even though they may be superficially different like like my mom's was identifying early with uh you know the the educated doctors of louisiana or wealthy people of louisiana uh, i mean pakistanis of louisiana you know who were educated so they were different than my dad's family but my dad was participating he was just a low-ranking member of the crypto feudal order and hierarchy in which they were higher ranking members and my mom didn't get that for her there was this apparent dichotomy between between educated people like her and cultured people like her from Pakistan and these lowly people she had mistakenly married into but the thing is Pakistani order as a whole and she, she like her station of people are not a dichotomy with lower people they're just superficially different and occupy a different station but my father was just a lower ranking member you know in, in that whole thing so that apparent dichotomy and for me like like going from like going of like identifying with more traditional a traditionalist religion uh, when i was younger in contrast to my father's kind of uh, i don't know what it was but like 
like superficial religious religiosity and then like the integral center in contrast to you know like uh, you know the the tanzima islamic quran academy in pakistan you know like so there's these apparent dichotomies that occur but the deep constitutional order or structure of these organizations is deeply identical in one and um yeah deeply identical in one and so like even before i left the point is like, relating this to my present experience that even though before i left the united states i had experienced this like cult uh, of, with a lot of different faces but the same damn thing uh, in a lot of like with a peerage right like with with a peerage anyways the same damn thing in a lot of different contexts in the united states and pakistan and internationally and then experience communal scapegoating which is basically they build this like really like straw man version of you in their own minds and then everything you do is interpreted through the straw man and that straw man identity is enforced onto you but that straw man is characterized by all the vices uh, and, and none, none of your virtues, like all vices that you may have in, in, in minuscule proportion or extremely exaggerated in the straw man. And all, any virtue you have is completely disregarded. And so it, it makes you into this demon, demonized, stupefied, idiotic version of yourself. And they project it onto you and they enforce it psychologically, socially. And so like I had experienced that in many different contexts because when you're in a vulnerable position and you're, you have codependent psychology, you get targeted by narcissists, right? And narcissistic cults, you get brought into the cult and it's very nice at first, but that's how you get trapped, you know? Anyways, um, so now after leaving, you know, I've experienced it again in, in completely different contexts. Like, for example, the city of Tbilisi in Georgia and Georgian people, like the way uh, they treated me by the end, by the time I left Georgia, like where I was having like cars, uh, like basically almost run me over repeatedly. And then like acting like it was no big deal. Like just looking at me nonchalantly, basically. Like, what are you going to do about it? Like, that sort of thing. And, and like, me, like, my thing is, like, I go quiet and I withdraw when I'm in difficulty and need. So I'm not going out and telling people that there's something wrong. Uh, I just kind of stick to myself and, like, endure, you know. I endure and try to solve the problem and I work on it and I put all my attention on it to try to get out of the situation. I'm not trying to, like, involve people in my shit. I don't do that. Right? So, so people start making up these stories. So experiencing the same communal scope, scapegoating in Tbilisi, which I've talked about in different videos. And then, um, you know, like even when, when I went to Luxembourg, I was staying for like maybe about two weeks in this place uh, where all these African people were staying um, that my friend Paula helped me get from the one my dorm limit, 30 day dorm limit was over or 28 days. I had to go somewhere else. And so she helped me get this room and it was her cousin's room that he didn't mind like subletting to me because, you know, he just wanted the extra money. And so I was staying there and, and then the black people there uh, or the African people there, sorry, uh, they were Christian predominantly. And, and you know, th they had some story or whatever, and they started doing the same thing, even though it was two in, within about two weeks. And then, and I don't remember that so clearly because it was only two weeks. But then after Luxembourg, when I actually went to uh, Oman, uh, like I've already talked about all the dynamics that happened in Oman, right? But then in Qatar, it's happening again, you know, and that's my point. It's happening here where like I went to this Indian restaurant this this morning and and it doesn't bother me as much because I've articulated so well and I know they're all talking to each other and, and then they're like being passive aggressive toward me because they recognize me because of my scarf, my hat, my glasses, you know, my backpack, um, you know, just my general description. And um you know, and I keep forgetting, you know, I'm just going to refuse to talk to them in Urdu from now on, you know, I'll just talk to them in English. That seems to help a lot. Um, you know, the, the moment you talk to them in their own language, they start, you know. Anyway, so I went to this restaurant and he's perfectly fine. I asked him some questions. Do you have Balak? I, I'm on a Balak. 
thing right now and um and so he says yes they do and we talk about it i go upstairs i order i sit i eat when i come down and pay him then he does a little indian thing and holds up his hand like after he's give, given me my change like i haven't said anything to him i've just silently paid him he does when he's giving me back the money he does like the the head the indian head thing and then he just holds up his hand after he's given me the money like it's it's like and and i didn't even notice because i was like moving on um but then it kind of registered what he was doing and it you know so these are and then there's this guy like south indian guy who has a little booth or he works for someone and who has a little booth he sells like eggs and like chai and stuff like that you know and uh, like small sandwiches and i was giving him business pretty regularly because it's like a like two boiled eggs is a good snack you know and, and some you know i was going there pretty regularly every so often and you know he was talking to me in english and then once he kind of joined the circuit he started asking around about who i was and stuff uh you know now every time i go like he's super bitchy like he's a total woman you know i uh, this other indian place where uh i was going uh, i stopped going but uh you know the the used to, he gave me like moom ki dal but he held it like the bad way you're not supposed to hold food like uh, indian guy who knows the etiquette of this sort of stuff and then these like it just like everywhere you know it's like and i'm in a completely different part of the city which was my exact criticism of the omani indian thing was because you know it would be like no matter what part of the city i'm in they've already already talked about me to each other you know and then that caribou coffee the managers are all indian and one or two of the guys who are in a lower level are indian and then the 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 guys at the other you know um the coffee bean across the street there's like one indian guy and so like the indian people are all talking to each other and these managers uh because they they don't understand right so if there's some they have god complexes they have irish irrational argument from authority epistemolo epistemolo epistemologies to their psychology like the way they determine what's real is argument from authority so because i don't fit within their model of authoritative argument nothing is possible that i could be doing with my life that they don't understand so if they don't understand what's going on with me or they don't have an idea of it uh they don't understand my behavior within their frame it's not possible to update their frame because the authorities from which they're deriving their frame don't have room for it and so like i must be doing something wrong or stupid right i must be doing something wrong or stupid that's how indian people think right they don't that's that's the problem it's all from authority right it's like from what previous whatever what society is saying they're all controlled externally through shame and so when they try to shame me i don't feel shame because i'm an american and i'm an individual i act from within myself i don't care what anybody else thinks right so the whole city within me being here one or two months and them all talking to each other blah 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 uh you know all the time like it's funny like i'm doing something i'm in i'm having my own problem i'm not talking about it with anybody but they have to talk about this ana this one person the whole city has to talk about it right like i'm a backpacker but the, all the indian people have to talk to each other about me because they're noticing something that's anom and then they have to try to shame me to communicate it's not like they can leave me alone because if in america if someone doesn't like what you're doing they leave you alone right but he what indian people have to do is they have to try to communicate to you that you're you're low status they have to try to shame you about it they have to try to bully you about it because they're that's what their parents did to them they're all psychos Asian people are all psychos. Indians are all psychos. They're like dogs, right? They're like dogs because a dog will either be submissive to you or he will be dominant over you. He doesn't understand how to have a mutually respectful relationship, right? And so they they all have to do this. So the same communal scapegoating I just mentioned a couple examples but that the phenomena of communal scapegoating that I've described amongst Indian people not only in my own family 
and tribe, hence my situation, and not only among similarly constituted cults within America, but again in Georgia, which is again a pre-modern, traditionalist sort of, uh, you know, uh, superficially modernizing, uh, you know, society. Qatar also can be described as de facto pre-modern, substantively pre-modern, but superficially modernizing uh, sort of city or, or country. And then like Indians are all like, Indians are just straight up pre-modern psychology, you know? And so um, that communal scapegoating happens, right? That communal scapegoating has happened in Georgia. It happened amongst... Um, and, and again, the, the characteristic of it is th they're cowards, so they won't confront you about it. They won't be like, what are you doing? Sometimes they'll ask you questions, right? But they'll frame the question in a way where like your answer, the, like the authentic answer won't fit within the small mindedness, like their small mindedness, like the frame of the question and the frame of mind from which they're asking the question, the, the answer will not fit within it you know and so like uh if you cannot answer them in the way that they need an answer that means again that you're stupid it's not that they're small-minded it's not that they're not capable of understanding something or that someone can have motives that are different than their own it's that you're stupid for not uh, being rational like them but again their idea of what's rational is derived from authority it's not independent reasoning it's not independent reasoning. It's not independent logic or rationality. Anyways, I have more systematic videos on that. I'm, not, I'm harping on it right now. Not making the point clearly as I would like. But, um, yeah, so that scapegoating has been happening, right? And it's funny, like, it doesn't matter what part of the city, or what area, what neighborhood... Uh, it's just interesting, right? Like this city, I don't know how many people are in Doha, maybe a couple million. And there's one person, uh, a refugee, trying to deal with his situation as best he can, right? And uh, as a result uh, of that, people who are watching him, they're talking to each other about him. And then they're trying to communicate shame and low status into him. It, that's happening so again like my case i will be able to say all these things because that's exactly what happened to me in my community of origin indian pakistani community of origin that's exactly what happened that's exactly the same dynamic communal scapegoating bullying gang rape it's existential gang rape um so that's it i think that's it um There's something, there's something more that I wanted to say, but I don't really remember it right now. Yeah, there's, there's good to it too. Like the opposite of this is, so there's the caribou coffee and um, the manager there, one of the managers, there's a bigger manager. He has this guy. Uh, it's just politics everywhere. So he has this guy from Sudan, and I like he's he's okay, you know. Uh, and so like through him, like we established a rapport that you know I would I would try to take like I wouldn't try to take up too much space. There's a lot of people. I would make sure to be courteous and not linger too long when they had a lot of business going on, like all this sort of stuff. You know, we kind of came to an info, and I was keeping to it, you know. And I, even before I was courteous, you know. Uh, but uh, once that agreement, but the, the, the other manager guy and the managers don't really show themselves that often. You know, there's this one Filipino lady and she's always like, try, she's like the, she's a bully, you know. And so she's noticed my nonconformity to like authoritative dictates and this sort of thing. And she's been like plotting and hatching the whole time. You know, and it's and then she finally the manager that that's like supportive of her, or like she's aligned with. I never seen this guy before, but he just uh, he came out, he came around the corner and just had a bitchy face on, mean ass face on, started yelling like super super, uh, like disrespectfully, 
not loud but disrespectfully and um yeah so started yelling disrespectfully and I just told him to shut the hell up kind of calmly he's like what I said shut the hell up very calmly and he's like you just a place of business you need to respect the place of like go do what you're going to do you know because it was like like you know I, I was doing everything that I was supposed to be doing problem was it was super hot that day I came in I fell asleep for like 10 minutes sitting there you know like on my phone I just sat it was the first time I fell asleep in there he just needed an excuse I knew what was going on that was inevitable what I could do is I could get up and leave and it would seem like I was leaving because he yelled at me or I could tell him to do what he was going to do and he was going to call the police and all that sort of stuff you know so he did that and ever since that happened like it's been kind of like a epicenter like people know that that happened because of course indian and filipinos talk about all everything you know so like they know that that happened you know and it's oh it's this super disrespectful thing dishonored i'm i'm oh my god my honor will never recover from that and now i'm supposed to be your bitch because i've lost all my status and face fuck you you know and then <laughs> And then secondly, and the police officers were super sweet. They were like, oh, you're Muslim. Uh, one of them was two-faced, as Qataris can be. But, you know, I, I know how to detect that. And, uh, you know, he's super sweet, and it was kind of fakish. But the Sudanese kind of second partner was dealing... He was, he was more direct and nicer, like really more substantially. And so it wasn't like that big of a deal. They, they were very respectful. You know, it was just like... They just talked about it and they're like it's better if you go right now and it's better if you try to stay away as much as you can and you know it was like that <laughs> and that's it you know and so now i'm supposed to be but but also i'm sick like i you know i'm already trying to get to i'm trying to get get to going you know so it's it's just like you know i'm already trying to get to going so it's not like i'm trying to be super be there any longer really you know i just whatever and uh secondly there's like the like the street gangs there's politics and that going on too and i'm just sick of all of it um but the flip side of that is that there's this nepali guy at the coffee bean like across from the caribou like across the street across the highway and that guy uh, i was talking to him and i just told him man like one of the things i hate about this place is like I, I you know I come from a good wealthy family my mom came from from old money and like we were always taught to be very respectful and that's what modernism meant to us like a sort of egalitarianism with everyone regardless of socioeconomic class you know and um, I, you know when I was in a I was never mean to anyone because you know they were working or they had less money than me or anything like that you know and, and it's just like in I'm now I'm in difficulty and the way people treat me I'm not really asking anybody for anything I'm not asking for help you know at least not like these people who are working at these places even though to be honest right, like people are making a lot of money here like there's a lot of money to be made even in those type of job roles even for like by American standards people are making good money and uh, you know like uh, in my situation like people seeing me around all the time instead of like scapegoating me they could easily help me you know and a collective so not any one person collectively they could easily have helped in a myriad of ways but i'm not asking but they could have given the amount of wealth that that people are generating from even simple jobs here you know and so um um yeah, so I talked to that Nepali guy and, I, and we connected, you know, I told him, look, I always like Nepali people because you guys are like, I, I'm from Lucknow, or like originally, like back in, in my ancestry and you guys feel familiar, like you feel like Indian, but like different in, in the right sort of way. And he immediately got what I was saying. Like, you, you, they, They're kind and respectful. And just because they're kind doesn't mean they're stupid. They're very intelligent, uh, just like Indian people. But in, unlike Indian people, they're also kind, you know. And so, 
Uh, he got what I was saying and we connected and and he we had a a short five to ten minute conversation maybe it was very fruitful ever since then he's talked to everybody else at the coffee bean and every time I go they always give me like a deal they have this ability to give two for one or they have they have these like things they can do you know uh, and they always do that even though the, the coffee bean is much nicer it's like a nicer place it's in a nicer building uh, it's it's the AC is better it's cleaner uh, like everything is nicer about it they treat me much nicer there and there's even this Filipino and I think the management there is actually Filipino and some of the workers are just Indian and the Filipino uh, there was this actually this Filipino guy who used to be like really like like angry face at me every time I got in there but that same guy behind it, like once he understood my situation, that I was just doing my case and then I would leave as soon as my case was finished, you know, once he understood that, he, he's the sweetest guy now. Like I want to give him a hug every time I see him, like he's super sweet. And, and the whole staff, like after the incidents happened, like they, they were super, they were extra sweet. Like they opened the door for me and I like, you know, like they, they were very, very over, you know, like accommodating in, in, in like in so many ways. The manager would always say hello to me, you know, and, and it's so nice, you know, it was so nice. So there's the opposite of that, too. You know, there is a good Asian, you know, sometimes I go overboard or absolutize this. There is a good version of it where there's a communalism that can be good. But, you know, the Indian way of doing it is so horrible. Like, it's so horrible. I hate it. It's, it's just terrible. I mean, at the same place, at the same coffee bean, I had this, uh, like, this black guy with this, uh, like, South Indian girl uh, coming toward me. And the South Indian girl, literally, when she saw me, she, like, pointed, laughed, and then, like, turned around and started whispering into the guy's ear. You know what I'm saying? So th th that Asian, pre-modern, conservative, like, you know, gossiping bullshit, like Catholic Europe, you know, that's, that's just, it sucks, you know, it sucks. And then it's to a point now where like in Oman, like when it was happening, the Omanis themselves were very good. Like, the, I love Omani people, you know, themselves. But here in Qatar, it's more like, it's, it's like, it's a continuum where the Qataris are on a higher level, but it's the same sort of thing, you know? And so, it's like, now it's getting to them, so there are Qataris who, like, show me contempt now. That's the best way to describe it, communal scapegoating and constant communication of contempt, you know? And by like people who like I'm paying money for services to, you know, that's the worst part where I cannot transact with you without being disrespected, you know, like that's, that's the worst, you know, like at least in America, there's a, there's a business courtesy, right? Like, uh, I mean, not that that's always ironclad, but like, you know, there's like this sense like, hey, we're having a business transaction. Let's just be courteous no matter what to each other, you know, like just through the transaction, you know, like let's not use transaction to you know like carry out our enmity toward each other for whatever reason you know there's more like hey this transaction is something we both need let's just go through it you know courteously but here it's like they use the transaction to uh, communicate uh something to you you know and i'm just gonna i i just like one this filipino guy uh like one thing what he did was like I was walking like across the street toward the sidewalk and he was walking on that sidewalk that I was heading toward like but way far away from me and so like he like started like super walking to try to like pass the point where I you know before you like that like stupid shit like that and I just screamed out like and then scream like I yelled out psychotic Asians you know and I've been just saying that and if it's an Indian person I'll say Bandar ki you know, or if it's a Filipino person, I'll say psychotic Asians because I don't want to target Filipinos specifically, it's an Asian thing, you know, it's an Asian psychology thing, and so I'll just yell out like, um, psychotic Asians, you know.
it's funny these Pakistani Indians are always like they're always around you know and they find ways to like listen to what you're doing and saying it just anyways yeah I'm not a political person you know I'm just not Okay, I'm going to end this one there. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.